this is Gary Carpenter again. I'm so glad to be able to visit with you again today. One of the hardest things on the walk of the Spirit, the walk of power, is learning how to distinguish between God's voice, your own thoughts, and even the thoughts of the enemy sometimes. As I said on a previous tape, Sue and I for 12 years before we met Pastor Dave and started attending the prayer center, we did our best to serve God. And we were saved and filled with the Holy Ghost, spoke with other tongues. But we kept hitting these brick walls. I mean, we, we did prison ministry. We did Bible studies. We did anything and everything. I even led worship in a church for a while because I was the only one that could play a musical instrument. But, you know, God has not blessed me with a singing voice. I can make a joyful noise unto the Lord, but that's about as far as it goes. But, uh, and God used us in all of those things, you know. Jesus says you can't even give a cup of cold water in his name and lose your reward. But still, it was like uh, we, we were doing our best to follow God, pretty much using our own logic and what was available. Prison ministry was available. We did that. Uh, worship at the church was available. We did that. Uh, people asked if we could do Bible studies. Yes, we could do that. But see, as I kept reading the, the, the Bible, especially the book of Acts, I'd come across passages like uh, Acts 16. And today, I'm, I'm going to go ahead and read that. I brought my Bible. I hope you have yours with you. But uh, this is one of the... This passage just always really got to me. Because Paul and Silas, you know, they live in the same dispensation we live in. This is after the resurrection. This is, this is the same dispensation uh, that you and I live in today. So what we see is available to them should be available to us. Well, here's these two fellows in uh, Acts 16, Paul and Silas, and they had finished uh, their assignment for God. Now they're wondering what to do next. And, and uh, that happened with Sue and I so often. We were how in the world do you do you know what really to do? You know, do you just pick something? I mean, there's so many things. You know, you can just go do these things. Or uh, let me read you what happened with them. So it's Acts 16, starting in verse six, talking about Paul and Silas, and it says, "Now when they had gone throughout Phrygia and the region of Galatia, and were forbidden of the Holy Ghost to preach the word in Asia, what?" Let's stop right there. Whoa, stop right there. See, in the beginning, I had a doctrinal issue <laughs> because the way I was raised, and I've told you before, I was raised Southern Baptist, and thank God for the Baptist, you know. But uh, if you're going to chisel a verse over the door of every Baptist church I ever attended, it would be, go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Those that believe and are baptized shall be saved, and those that don't shall be damned. And that's... That's, boy, you could just chisel that. So my thinking was, go ye. So that, go ye into all the world. Well, I read this and I'm going, well, what do you mean the Holy Ghost forbade them to, to preach the word in Asia? Isn't Asia part of the world? I mean, I have chapter and verse. I have, I have, I have a problem with this verse. <laughs> I have chapter and verse for go ye into all the world. Asia is part of the world. Well, let's keep reading here. Because here it plainly says they were forbidden of the Holy Ghost. To preach the word in Asia. So after they were come to Mycenae, they assayed, they thought about, they were weighing in their mind whether to go into Bithynia. And here it is again. But the Spirit, and that's a capital S, the Holy Spirit, suffered them not. He did not permit them to do that. And I'm going again. Well, isn't Bithynia part of the world? Don't we have a command from Jesus? Go ye into all the world. Now, before I go any farther, let me mention this. You'll keep reading in the book of Acts, where later on Paul did go into Asia, which at the time Ephesus was considered Asia, and spent two years there and had a mighty work, uh, raised up a church, and, and he did preach the word in Asia. So I began to understand, yes, we are to go into all the world, but you know, here's a revelation. Here's deep calleth unto deep. Jesus is alive and well. In the same way that he had instructions on a day-by-day -day basis to the twelve that you read about in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Go here, go there, uh, prepare the upper room, go get this donkey, uh, go into these villages and preach. In the same way that he had instructions for the twelve, 
he is alive and well? You mean he has instructions available to us today? He wanted the word preached in Asia, but he didn't want it preached there first. He has a, I like to call it a right now, a right now mind for you. He has, he has things today that he would like to have you do. Our problem is we don't hear him. And I used to really complain about that. I said, now, this is not fair. I said, now, as I read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, Peter, and James, and John, and they got to actually follow you in the, in the flesh, you know, for three and a half years. And, and they could, with their physical ear, they could hear your physical voice, you know. And there wasn't any of this, oh, I wonder if that was God. I mean, <laughs> they, were, they could hear you speak directly to them. And then they would, they would go do those assignments. I said, I don't have that same advantage. And I, so I was kind of whining. I don't know none of you have ever done that, but I was complaining to the Lord, you know. And don't ever do that because here's what happened. He said, what about my servant, Paul? And I went, oh, he didn't even get saved till after the resurrection. Oh, that's right. He wasn't hand trained by you physically, was he? He said, no, my servant, Paul, had the same teacher and guide that you have, and that's the Holy Spirit. If he could be trained how to hear my voice and follow me, so can you. Well, <laughs> here we go. <laughs> so let's get, let's get back to this for a moment here, because they were hearing from the Holy Ghost not to do certain things, but they still didn't know the answer. So it says, uh, I'll read verse 7 again. It says, After they were come to Mycenae, they assayed to go down into Bithynia. But the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, he suffered them not, he didn't allow it. Uh, yes, sir, I'm, I'm not going to pass that by. You need to understand now, Jesus, when he was instructing his disciples right before he was uh, the cross and he was resurrected then, let's say it this way, before he left the planet to be with the Father, he was instructing them about this Holy Spirit, this other comforter that was to come. And he says, he's going to take of mine and show it unto you. He shall not speak of himself, but what he hears, that's what he'll speak. And for the longest time, I didn't really get the significance of that. And then finally, one day I got it. When, what he was letting his disciples know was, look, I'm still going to be your Lord. I'm still going to be the head of the church. What's going to happen, though? The Holy Spirit is not coming to become your Lord. He is coming to bring you my Lordship. The Holy Spirit is omnipresent. He's everywhere at once. He's with every believer on earth. He's also with the, he's like at the throne in heaven. He hears everything. What he hears the Lord Jesus say, that is what he's going to instruct you to do. He's not coming to be your Lord. He's coming to bring you, let's say it this way, the, the Lordship of Christ, the mind of Christ, the instructions of the Master for your individual life. And that's what's happening here. The reason the Holy Spirit forbade them to go to Asia wasn't the mind of Christ at this time. Later on it was. The reason he forbid them to go to Bithynia, well, not at this time. Jesus is alive and well. There is a leadership that can come by the Holy Spirit. If this was available to them in the book of Acts, it is available to us today. Well, so let's keep going. Let's see how the leadership did come in this case. So it says, um, verse 8, And they passing by Mycenae came down to Troas, and a vision appeared to Paul in the night. A vi now, did you get that? A vision. One of the ways that the Holy Spirit communicates is by visions. He does also by dreams. He can speak words to you. Sometimes the communication will come in the form of a revelation. You, one minute you didn't know what to do, the next minute you do know what to do. The leadership that comes by the Holy Spirit, we often say, uh, I heard. Well, and sometimes you do. Uh, I guess I'll, I'll digress here for a moment now. In the early days when, when Sue and I were trying to learn how to distinguish God's voice, by the way, that's, a, that's the name of a teaching series by Pastor Dave Roberson. And if you're really interested in training yourself to be able to distinguish God's voice from your own thoughts, and even the, <laughs> sometimes the enemy will try and direct you, I highly recommend that teaching series. It's a two, just two messages, and I'm not about to try and teach that on this short video. 
but I highly recommend it to you. You can go to his website, www.daveroberson.org, and it's there available to you for free. You can download it, play it on your computer, put it on your iPod, or you can just click and play at your computer. But if you'll do, that's what I did. I did it for hours, I did it for days, I did it for weeks, I did it for months until I was able to distinguish God's voice. Now, in the beginning, what I started to say, when I first began to hear the Lord, it was nearly always words. I would hear uh, even a word of knowledge would come that, that way or a word of wisdom. Uh, on another video, we'll talk about more about the gifts of the Spirit. But uh, let me give you an example. We're going to look at a Bible example here, but let me give you an example of how it used to come in the early days. I remember one night I was doing a, a Sunday night service, and, and then after the service, a young lady asked me to pray for her. And it was November. We were getting near Thanksgiving time and the holidays. And uh, she, I said, well, sure, I'll pray with you. What's, you know, what do you want? And she said, well... My parents live in another state. I only get to see them once a year. They come in for the holidays. And I love my parents, and they love me, and we always uh, try and have a good time. But every time they come, try as we might. We get in a big fight. We argue, and it's just terrible, and they leave, and they're angry, and I'm angry, and it takes us a long time to get over it. She said, would you just please pray that this year when my parents come, we'll have peace in the house. Well, how do you, sure, you know, I mean, how do you do that? I, so I said, sure, let me pray for you. And I was just fixing to do what I call a Gary prayer. <laughs> it's a normal prayer, you know, like you would pray if you don't get any other instruction from the Holy Ghost, you know, you're just going to pray. So I'm kind of, I'm kind of exaggerating a little here, but something along the lines of, oh God, I thank you that when her parents come, you are the great Shalom, you know, <laughs> I'm exaggerating a little. The, Father, I just pray that peace will come in the house and that they'll have peace and good fellowship and it'll be wonderful. I was fixing to pray right along that line. Just as I was beginning to pray that, I heard a voice. I heard, I mean, it, okay, now how do I exp I'm not sure it was a voice. <laughs> I heard this. <laughs> I heard a portion of Scripture on the inside of me. And I heard it just, I'm not going to tell you yet what it was. I heard it just as clear. And I went, huh. But i be honest with you, I was, going, I, dis, I was going to dismiss it. And I started again. Oh, thou art the great shalom. You know? <laughs> and I heard it again. The third time that happened. And finally, I, I told the lady, I, I just honest with her. I said, every time I get ready to pray for you, I hear the Holy Ghost. I hear in my spirit a portion of Scripture. And would you like to know what it is? She said, well, sure. I said, well, I don't think this has anything to do. See, here's the other part. What I, what I was hearing, it seemed to have no relevance whatsoever to her prayer. <laughs> so I told her, this is what I was hearing. I said, well, I hear this part of the scripture that says, eat what is set before you. <laughs> when I said that to her, her eyes went, she got like... I could tell I hit a nerve of some kind, and she actually, a little flash of anger for just a moment, like, and then she goes, she softened, and she went, you don't know. You don't know. You don't know, do you? And I'm going, I guess not. <laughs> she says, well, what you don't know is I'm a vegetarian. My parents are not. And when they come, you know, they want to have the traditional turkey and the dressing and the giblet gravy and all of the stuff that goes with that. And... I'm always going to try and, and, and be a, you know, just let them have their way. But eventually, you know, I, I, I start telling them how bad that is for you and the cholesterol is going to kill you. And I start, and that's what always starts the argument. That's what we get into a big argument about. <laughs> so I said, now, you, you, your prayer, your prayer was that you wanted peace with your parents for these few days, these two or three days that they're going to be with you. Is that right? She said, yes. I said, the Holy Spirit is giving you the answer to that prayer. Listen, as his disciple, if you're going to minister to your parents, then on this assignment, for those two or three days, you eat what is set before you. You bow to them. You serve them. Now, at least, I mean, he's really saying eat what is set before you, but at least don't complain about what's set before them. <laughs> don't get into that argument. It won't hurt you a couple of days to bow to your parents and honor them and have peace in the house. You can go back to being a vegetarian the, 
other 362 days a year or whatever's left. So she received that. That was one of my first encounters with that voice, that leadership, that understanding. There was no way in the world that I would ever have known that what was causing their arguments was this dispute between a vegetarian and a meatitarian. <laughs> you know, people that, I, I would never have been able to know that. That's called a word of knowledge incorporated with a word of wisdom. Not only did it have in it the knowledge of what was causing the problem, but also within it was the wisdom on how to solve the problem. That's the way his leadership comes. That's one way. That time I heard a voice. I'll get into the visions personal here in a minute. But let's, in this case, let's get back to Acts 16 now. I want to show you, in this case, this was a, a vision that came in the night. We're not, that may have been a dream. I don't know. It doesn't say it was a dream, though. It says, verse 9, And a vision appeared to Paul in the night. There stood a man of Macedonia and prayed him, saying, Come over into Macedonia and help us. <laughs> now, see, I always say I'm not the sharpest knife in the drawer, but if I if I was trying to figure out God, where do you want me to go? And in the night I had a vision, and I I don't know how he knew he was a man of Macedonia, maybe some of their clothing or something, I I don't know, but somehow in the vision you know how dreams are. Sometimes you just know and you don't know how you know. But if a man, if, you know, if I'm not the sharpest knife in the drawer, but if I had a vision, and there's a man of Macedonia, and I'm wondering where should I go, God, and this man come over into Macedonia and help us. I think even I would get that. <laughs> you know? So that's what they did. In verse 10 it says, And after he had seen the vision, after he had seen the vision, immediately we endeavored to go into Macedonia, assuredly gathering that the Lord had called us for to preach the gospel unto them. Now, because of the time limitations we have today, I'm not going to go into the whole rest of this story, but let me, let me summarize something for you. There's a lot of teaching that I had to unlearn as I began to really turn myself over to the Holy Spirit. Dave Roberson taught us that the more time you can uh, pray those mysteries, which I've already talked about on a previous message, the more you can pray those mysteries. You're, you're not explaining mysteries to God. God is explaining mysteries to you, things you've wanted to know your whole life, like what is my calling? What is it you want me to do? Uh, am I a pastor? Am I an apostle? Am I... Uh, anointed janitor. What am I? You know, and whatever it is he's called you to do, boy, that's where your anointing is and, and, and you want to you follow that. We, as we begin to do the teachings that are available, again, through his website and other, other methods, we begin to distinguish God's voice. We begin to hear him. But one of the teachings that I had to overcome, see, I was always taught that uh, that verse that talks about well, he opens doors that no man can shut and so forth, you know. And, and the end result of the way they would teach that is if it's really God, you, you, you know, your circumstances will be smooth and he'll, he'll, he'll make the path plain. And Our experience has been when you do hear his voice and he says, go that way, the first sound you're going to hear is the devil slamming every door shut on that path. And you're going to have to kick them open in the name of Jesus to accomplish what he called you to do. Now, in this case here, there's no doubt that God called Paul and Silas, go to Macedonia. Go to Macedonia. So they go. And if we read the whole story, you'd see what all happened there. But eventually they come to this fortune-telling girl. She has a demon on the inside of her. And she keeps following them and speaking, you know. Well, finally, after a while, Paul says, enough of that. And he commands that spirit out of her in the name of Jesus and that girl gets delivered which is wonderful we say except there were businessmen that were making money off of her as a fortune teller so in in today's jargon we'd say that they sued Paul you know and okay now you've obeyed God now here comes this lawsuit against you you know and and they were arrested they were whipped their backs were bloody they were put in prison and in the stocks, I don't know if they had, I don't know what their stocks were like uh, uh, in, in uh, Macedonia. I always had this picture like in England, you know, they got those wooden stocks and your head would fit through in your hands like this, you know. Can't you just see Paul and Silas in the prison, backs bloody? They're side by side, you know. Silas looks over at Paul and said, had a dream, did you? 
<laughs> heard God, did you? <laughs> you can't judge always by your circumstances. You're, you, if you follow circumstances, the devil will lead you around like water. You know what water is? Water follows the path of least resistance. And that's the way the devil will try. That's one of his ways for leading Christians. Oh, it must be God because this is the easy way. I've not found that to be the case. When it's God, there may be all kinds of obstacles, but you will go through every one of them in the name of Jesus. So let's finish that story. Yes, okay, they got arrested. They were in the stocks. They were, their backs were all bloodied. Boy, if you're just going by circumstances, sure look like they missed God. Well, then an earthquake comes, and because they started worshiping and praising God anyway. They knew the secret of what to do. Right in the midst of, of your difficulties, you lift your hands. It says at midnight, they sang songs and worshiped, and they didn't do it quietly either. It says all the other prisoners could hear them. Can't you just, oh, I'd like to be able to have heard that, singing and shouting praises to God at midnight, you know. And it so pleased God, an earthquake came, shook, shook the prison, and opened all the prison doors. And they didn't leave. The jailer, when he, the, the head of the jail, when he got there, he, he was going to kill himself because he figured, okay, it's, it's my responsibility. I, uh, you know, he was going to kill himself. And Paul cried out, he says, don't harm yourself, we're all here. And that so moved that, that Philippian jailer. He said, what must I do to be saved? Paul said, believe on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, thou shalt be saved and thy house. That right there was the beginning of the church at Philippi. Philippi was the chief city of Macedonia. Later on, when Paul writes his letter back to, Philip, to the Philippians, they had sent a gift. And he says in that letter, in the beginning of my ministry, no other church but you. No other church but you helped me financially and communicated again and again. Even when I'd go to Thessalonica, you would send an offering again. In Corinthians, he talks about the gift that came from the Macedonians. What was God doing? One of the things God was doing was establishing the financial base of Paul's ministry for the next 15 years. You think God doesn't know what he's doing? Sure, you can go into Asia. Sure, you can go into Bithynia. It's going to take money. Let's establish this first one in Philippi because I see that that's the place where your financial base will come from and you'll be able to do everything that I've called you to do. Now, Paul, he subsidized his own ministry by making tents himself. He was not one of these, and I have to be careful here, he's not, he, he was not a greedy preacher. 